three experts here um, who are going to be able to answer all of your pollinator and pollinator garden questions. Um, Del Orlowski, Cindy Muro, and Melissa Peterson. Um, unfortunately, Chris Lehman is unable to join us this evening, but if you have questions specifically for Chris, um, you can convey them uh, through the pollinator pathway and he'll be able to answer them uh, virtually as well. Um, and uh, so right now I'm going to hand it over to Ellie, who's going to explain to you quickly just how we're going to ask the questions, how it's going to work, and have a really great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex. My name is Ellie Reese. I'm a member of the Woodstock Pollinator Pathway Planning Committee and uh, the Program and Outreach Coordinator for the Woodstock Land Conservancy. I'll be your Q&A moderator tonight. Um, so the way that we're imagining this evening to work is a kind of casual conversational question and answer session. Um, we're going to ask everyone to mute themselves for now. Um, and when you have a question to ask one of our experts, we're going to ask you to use the raise hand function or just raise your hand in the screen so that I can see it. In most computers, if you put your hand in the screen, kind of like I'm doing right now, it'll eventually recognize that you want to hit the raise hand function and it'll let me know. Um, and once I call on you by name, then you can unmute yourself and ask your expert the question that you have. Um, um, so right now I'm going to ask our experts to introduce themselves and I'm going to call them by name just so you know we go in order and nobody's talking over each other um, and they're going to introduce themselves and then we will have we will open it up for everyone to ask their questions so I'm going to ask right now for Dell to introduce himself and speak a little bit about um, his expertise and why he's here tonight Dell you are muted sir <laughs> Okay, so um, yes, my name, um, my background is uh, I have a, a master's degree in sustainable land planning and design, and my uh, undergraduate is in uh, in, in um, uh, biology uh, and mathematics. Uh, so I have a lot of background in ecology, as and and I I use the landscaping as as a means to uh, apply e ecological uh, ideas to the land, uh, and uh, so this. Is something I, I, I've worked with a landscape architect for 12 years uh, doing uh, mainly wetland restoration work. So um, uh, a lot of my background is in uh, wetland restoration and mitigation. Uh, mitigation is just uh, um, making improvements uh, on an area that we want to do. So my um, uh, so uh, recently I've been working uh, uh, with the Ashokan Center and doing uh, educational programs. Uh, a new one, a program we're doing is uh, is a uh, pollinator um, uh, educational program uh, for people in the cities. The uh, people that come up uh, a lot of times from uh, New York City uh, or uh, New Jersey or Connecticut, and they'll they'll stay, and uh, we'll be doing uh, programs with them about that. And uh, so it's uh, it's kind of a fun uh, um, way to introduction uh, introduce uh, uh, the ideas of a pollinator and, and how it uh, is. It's about uh, really about uh, increasing biodiversity, and that's the whole point of it. So that's my uh, a quick uh, overview. Thank you, Dal. And Cindy, if you could introduce yourself, please. Sure, I'm Cindy Muro. Um, let's see. Um, I have an associate's degree in horticulture. I've been gardening since second grade. Um, I've done a bajillion different types of work as in growing plants from my last job was managing the Mohawk Mountain House greenhouses for the 18 years. I've worked in wholesale nurseries. I've been a florist. I've been a, a little bit of everything. Um, and now I'm retired. And um, what's most important to me now is um, spreading the love for plants, especially to young people, um, but also just you know, doing, spreading the education about our environment and, and um, helping people learn what they need to know about being successful growing plants. Um, and that's why I'm here. Thanks so much, Cindy. Sure. Melissa? Hi, everybody. So I'm Melissa and I work with the Woodstock Land Conservancy um, 
I am coordinating stewardship and also land acquisitions right now. A little bit about my background. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in biology where my emphasis was on botany and a graduate degree in environmental conservation. Um, before this job, I was working with the Orange County Audubon Society. I am a master gardener and I have a permaculture design certificate as well. And sort of professionally, some of the different things I've done is, uh, you know, working on botanical inventories all over the West Coast and up in Alaska as well. Um, and then one recently here in Orange County in New York. Um, what else? Worked in greenhouses, I've done garden design for people, sort of a, a lot of different things. But I think most importantly, I love plants and I've been gardening since I was a child. Um, my family are all gardeners. I grew up in gardens and, you know, I used to play in the compost pile. So <laughs> meaning I used to just like dig in it and, and love seeing everything happening. You know, it was like, you know, the stuff has thrilled me since I was very young, being outside, getting my hands dirty, watching things grow. And I love gardening from, you know, vegetable gardening to ornamental gardening to ecological gardening where I am, you know, just trying to recreate a natural system from an area that has been heavily disturbed and filled with invasives. And anyway, I love it all. So I'm happy to be here tonight and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Melissa. I'm actually going to call um, our first question is going to come from our own committee, just because Georgia posed this wonderful question prior to the meeting opening. So I'd like her to ask her question first and kind of get the conversation flowing. And if something sparks your imagination or you have a burning question, please do use the, that raise hand function that I mentioned. If you don't know where that is, it's at the bottom bar or the top bar, depending what type of device you're using, in that little reactions button where you see a happy face and a plus on the happy face, that's where you'll find your raise hand function. Or you can, if your video is on, you can stick your little hand up like that and I will know you're raising, raising your hand and I will make note of that and call on you when I have a chance to. Okay, so I'm going to ask Georgia Asher to unmute herself so that she can ask her question. Okay, I'm Georgia. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, we have a meadow, a big meadow that's actually uh, got a lot of uh, native plants. It's pollinator plants, it's, it's wild. We haven't done anything with it. It's just the way it is. And um, we're trying to increase the biodiversity there by adding plants to it. But the problem is you can't really, you know, like put, uh, dig a hole to plant a plant because it's um, very rocky and it takes half an hour just to dig one little hole to plant a plant. So that's not really practical. So my question is, is there a way that I can um, use seeds uh, particularly now, you know, like in the beginning of winter, uh, to plant new species. I want to add new species of pollinator plants into the meadow. Um, is there a way I can do that with seeds without, you know, having them be totally um, outcompeted by what's there already? So I, I'll, I'll jump in and uh, answer that because uh, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, okay. I, I understand that a lot of the uh, that uh, really rocky areas are, are really a tough site. And, and you have to look at whether it's a, a rocky shady area, a rocky sunny area. Uh, if there's heat, you know, um, a sun uh, on there, it's going to be really warm. So um, you have it's to. Sunny. It, yeah, so it's sunny. Uh, so. Um, so that's a really, really dry. Plus, you probably, if it's open uh, to uh, deer uh, browsing, uh, that's another, uh, you know. Thank you. So all those things have to uh, um, limit the, your, the amount of plants. I would look around uh, what's growing there right now, even the weeds that are growing, and see what's growing there now and, and being successful. Uh, and then, but uh, seeds uh, would be the way to go. After you have your selection of seed, uh, uh, seeds, you can actually plant those uh, in the uh, as a dormant seeding 
but make sure that they're a, uh, a good seed to soil contact uh, between them. Um, make sure it's roughed up uh, and, and, uh, and covered and then even mulch it. Um, so uh, if it's open, uh, the raindrops uh, falling from the sky are gonna be a uh, good wash uh, out. Uh, if you, if I recall you having a very hilly area so that could be a, 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 a place for erosion. So you want to protect that. Colleagues so, actually prefer chaos. So that, 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 that I would say that the dormant seeding is the, is the, the most successful uh, that I've ever had. Um, and uh, uh, if, you, if you don't want to do uh, um, that, I would, I, um, uh, I would recommend doing uh, plugs, these small two and a half inch to seven inch uh, plugs and, and try to um, incorporate them into certain areas. Um, and then try to, uh, you know, then you can have more control over the specific species uh, in that area. Yeah. So um, it's, um, do I have to find like bare patches to plant things in and then, and sort of mulch around to keep the competition down and do I do I do it I assume right now or you know like in a week or two right before snow or something like that and do I have to plant like a lot of seeds to make sure that something will some of them will take um yeah, you, uh, uh, in terms of your question about uh, uh, bare spots you have to ask why is it a bare spot you know uh, it might be rock is just right underneath there oh, and yeah. it'd be really hard to grow. So uh, you might yeah. want to do a little soil testing and, and see what you're working with first. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of seed, uh, I would um, uh, just uh, scratch it in um, as you would in, in a normal lawn. You could actually uh, put those in. But, scratch uh, it in? Yeah, scratch it in mm -hmm. and then, and then uh, cover, make sure it's covered uh, over with soil a little bit. Uh, and see uh, um, and and see what the uh, what happens in the winter time. If you get we get a lot of snow, then it's going to water it. So, but dormant seeding is a really good, and this is a perfect time to do that before the snow comes. Put it in uh, now, and then uh, make sure it's covered, and uh, and even mulch it with some even straw of some sort, a weed-free straw, mm -hmm. or even leaves. Uh, you could do that as well. Um, just don't uh, pack it down too too uh, tight. Uh, you know, maybe smoke leaves and things like that, or or there are a little more air in between them. So, but that that's what I would recommend. Maybe uh, Cindy has an idea. Okay, thanks, Del. That was great. Um, I got a couple things I can add to that, and um, I think that this information will be super helpful for everybody who's listening tonight. Um, you know, even though I know tons and tons about growing plants, I, ne I don't know whether it's um, because it's the nature of gardeners, but you never stop learning. And so um, there's a couple of podcasts that I listen to frequently that, um, and sometimes I listen to them and go, yeah, yeah, I kind of know all that. And then sometimes I listen and go, oh, there's a nugget. So um, there's one that I listen to and it's just kind of ironic or serendipitic or whatever that in the last two weeks, the topics have been extremely apropos to what we're talking about tonight. Um, the podcast is called Joe the Gardener. And um, if you listen to podcasts, it's easy to find. And I think that um, Ellie was gonna put a link in the chat. I did, yep. Um, and so this week, the topic was an expert who spoke about the easiest way to start growing native plants from seed in the winter time. And um, it's pretty amazing because if you have, if you collect some seeds, which you may not have been aware of this and didn't do this year, but you can kind of note it for next summer and spring, next summer and fall to collect up some seeds that are growing around your area. Um, and, and a lot of these seeds, they start um, with no special equipment um, outside. You, you, you collect some seeds and you put them in pots and you put them outside. And if you listen to this podcast, you will feel so relaxed and so much better about how simple it can be. 
Um, and then the other podcast was last week's, which all these podcasts have archives, which was converting a lawn into a meadow. And it kind of went from every single possible scenario about how to start a meadow from seeds or plugs or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that, so in particular things to look for is if you've got a dry, shallow soil, very sunny thing, you wanna particularly get seeds that are suited for that. And you can look at what's growing around or you can Google it, you know, you know, uh, wild native plants for a dry, rocky area in New York. And I bet you'll come up with some names. I mean, one that comes to my mind is Pearly Everlasting Time. You know, I'm sure there's things. So, um, so those are some huge resources. And, and I find that gardening podcasts, you know, if you go outside or go for a walk or have some just like quiet time, you can like have this little resource of education going into your brain um, all the time. So yeah, that's what I would say. I, I highly recommend poking around in the pot gardening podcast world. You can learn, a, I've learned a ton this summer from, um, well, I can't think of her name now, but I will, um, uh, from listening to podcasts, but definitely check out Joe's garden. He's got lots of great topics. Thank you. I know that Alex has a question. And before I go to her, I just want to make sure that nobody else has a question. Oh, Richard has a question. Richard, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, this is in Richard. It's Melissa. I'm his wife using okay. his computer, but <laughs> thank you. And my question is for Dell because we recently moved into a house and in the backyard, we have a pond. And beyond the pond are three old beaver dams that are no longer with the beavers, but the water is just all over. <laughs> and we need, we desperately need some wetland restoration. And I know we had the pollinator pathway people come and tell us how wonderful it is to have the beavers and we shouldn't be upset that they chop down and destroy, uh, uh, didn't destroy, but all the trees are gone and it's part of nature and it's wonderful and it's beautiful and all that. But in the meanwhile, our backyard is, well, one of our neighbors called it a swamp. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful pond. The pond is full of duckweed and, uh, you know, green algae and all that kind of stuff. I guess it's very mucky on the bottom. And we just really need some help. It overflows. We've had these hurricanes and the waters just come up and then the water comes down the mountain and help. <laughs> if there's anything you can recommend or what we could do, it would be. Uh... Yeah, there's some uh, a beautiful um, um, wetland plants that are, I would highly recommend. I, I've uh, installed a number of stormwater management uh, areas, uh, uh, there's rain gardens. Uh, mm -hmm. They're kind of like a beautiful garden uh, that also has a functional aspect to it. And, uh, and the, the, uh, they're, uh, oftentimes they're depressions that hold the water for about uh, 24 or 48 hours. And then they, uh, they should uh, empty out by then. Um, so the plants have to be selected for both dry and wet. Uh, but uh, uh, you have a, an, a wetland area that uh, it, it's um, uh, built up because of the beaver. Um, is the beaver, did you say he's still there? Uh, no. no, they, no. they moved like three times and we've, we've been here just almost a year. We moved yeah. in at the like December last year and we've just been observing and trying to figure out how to get the water, you know, yeah. down yeah. in one part, so they're, circulating they're, in another part. So, so there's uh, uh, things like cardinal flower and, and turtle head, and um, uh, there's a lot of ferns that I would also incro incorporate if it's uh, somewhat shady. Um, but there's also other plants that will do well uh, in more open areas as well. 
uh, because it's wet, um, and, you know, things like uh, hay scent to fern, uh, depending on the, the size. But I, I, the cardinal flower in, in turtle head and, and, um, and spiderwort, uh, there's, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of asters, uh, I would, uh, uh, would be a, a good uh, mix, you know, the, into that. Uh, so you have a, 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 a to have a, a, a variety of different plants that bloom throughout the year uh, by having more vegetation along the edges, uh, even adding uh, sedges uh, along the edges. Um, and there's uh, tussock sedges and and other sed beautiful sedges that are um, that will help stabilize the uh, uh, the the soil uh, along the edge. Uh, and they uh, add and they they're growing in clumps, so you can plant. A, um, uh, wetland plants in between them. Uh, so that's what I would recommend. Um, adding some shrubs as well uh, into the area, you know, uh, and there's a number of beautiful uh, um, from uh, hollies or native holly uh, of winterberry and, and uh, summer sweet is a beautiful one. Uh, Clethra anifolia is the botanical name uh, for that. And it has a very nice fragrance in the, in the, uh, in the summertime. So um, uh, those are just a couple of uh, ideas. And some of them are, are uh, most of those are pretty deer resistant as well. So um, I would uh, focus on, on those. Uh, there, you know, some of them are, are less so, uh, but, uh, but you have to pick those uh, if you have a, a high deer population. But wetlands are great for, uh, for biodiversity. Uh, you're yeah. gonna see a lot of uh, birds. I would also recommend putting uh, some sort of um, uh, boxes up there, if it's uh, depending whether bluebird boxes or even a duck uh, a box, uh, uh, wood duck uh, uh, box, if that's uh, appropriate. But you, know, you might get a lot of uh, um, um, uh, the uh, uh, great blue heron if there's fish. Are there fish in the? Uh... Um, we don't have fish, and that was going to be my next question to you. Would you recommend putting in fish? I know. We were told we can have koi or a certain type of carp that's sterile or something, but they're not native. Yeah, so. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend putting carp in because they just they disturb the bottom of the uh, the the, the uh, pond. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't want to uh, just do that. Um, a lot of people do that to keep eat the uh, the algae and. Right. Uh, but it's not. I I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, and and also if it there's no fish at all. That, that's also another habitat for a lot of uh, amphibians. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I would, uh, uh, and, and once you incorporate fish, uh, a lot of those, uh, um, it, it's not as uh, ideal uh, for those amphibians. Uh, wow. I didn't realize that. We have a lot of salamanders and we have dragon, we have a lot of frogs and turtles and snakes. Exactly. So it's a, it's all like that. Yeah, no, we do. We do. That's exciting. So no fish and just keep adding the plants. We've been to the, uh, what is it? The Catskill Native Nursery. We sort of been living there <laughs> since <laughs> we moved in. Um, but do you make house calls? Do you have a business? Can I get a card or? Yeah, I, I'll be happy to do a consultation and help you out. Okay. Uh, sourcing plants as well. If you would like to reach Dell, you're more than welcome to reach out to the Woodstock New York Pollinator Pathway at gmail.com. Okay. And then we can connect you with him. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you for your question. Is there anyone else who has a question? If not, I'll call on Alex next. All right. So Alex, ask your question. Hey, hi, I don't know who this is for. Um, it's not a technical question, but we talk a lot about planting native species um, because they're adapted to our climate. They're adapted to the native, you know, uh, insects, birds, um, but our climate is changing so much. So is there going to be a time? Are we at it? Is it coming when we have to start thinking about native species of a different um, ecosystem because our native native species won't survive in this climate anymore? Um, are we are we getting to a point where we're planting the wrong things because there are things that now are going to not be um, adapted to what our ecosystem is turning into? Um, I've just always wondered about that and I've never um, really heard an answer. So I appreciate it. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say something quickly in that um, 
you know, I mean, it has been happening. <laughs> it's been happening now for a while and the ranges are slowly shifting in areas that were, you know, zone six 20 years ago are, you know, the, all the zones are changing ever so slightly and they will continue to do so, but it's all happening very slowly. Um, so you don't need to go out and, you, you know, what you want to do is grow what's successful now, continue to grow the natives because you're supporting all of these native species that are dependent on these. And as they're, you know, experiencing these stresses and having to shift their ranges, um, the more we can support them in this effort in this time, um, the better. And then we just have to adapt sort of as we see things shifting. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's sort of an answer. It's sort of a non-answer. It's all just happening very slowly, but it's been happening um, as well. It's happening faster now, but it's still a gradual process. So, um, so yes, but it's not something that, um, you know, isn't uh, critical. Like, uh, you know, we're not shift changing everything right away right now. So what were you going to say, Cindy? Oh, I would just like to add to that. As someone, I've been planting trees and, uh, in the town of Woodstock for the past 30 years. And, and I give a great amount of thought to which trees, um, you know, what I select. And I would say, particularly for something like trees that last a lot longer than say perennials or, you know, whatever shrubs, is that I think the best thing to do is have diversity because you don't necessarily know which way we're going. And, you know, there's talk about, well, it won't be cold enough for the sugar maples to make maple sugar anymore or this or that or different insects. You, we've got spotter and lantern flies heading our way and, you know, they're going to take down certain things. And we've just had the ash borer decimate our ash trees in the entire area. So I think the best thing to do, you know, particularly if you're thinking about trees, is to plant some diversity, some, you know, and, and you know, and I'm much more interested in things that are gonna feed the birds and the insects and this and that right now. Um, I was just listening to the, 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 the one of the podcasts that I recommended about um, native plants talked about how so many people want to plant things that have, you know, red leaves or different color leaves, and they're completely unuseful for the native uh, insect population. So, um, so it's important for that. But I think, you know, just planting a variety of stuff, and particularly a variety of stuff that's more native and not non-native, um, is, is about the best, you know, that we can shoot for at this time. Yeah, I think those are excellent points, you know, and I think that that like, not just for climate change, but for everything, it's always a good rule to try and go for diversity, because you are creating, you know, your best cushion of defense, right? You're, you're creating the greatest resiliency if you have diversity in your plantings. And absolutely, if you're planting, you know, long-term with trees, you do want to be considering because they have that long um, life span. So an interesting thing, you know, when I was saying this has been happening for a long time, one of the um, red mulberries, uh, you know, they, they weren't really growing. There were some, but they weren't really growing in this area 100 years ago, and they've been moving northward. Um, there are a number of species that you can sort of see that we're starting to track as they're moving northward. And then some things, you know, can go the opposite way, but most things are moving northward. Um, but there's a lot of red mulberry in the area where I live right now. And 100 years ago, when you look back at botanical inventories, it was pretty rare to find a red mulberry in this area. They were, it was just, just at the edge of its range, you know, but it's creeping northward, so. Wow, interesting. <laughs> um, I have a question that came in through the chat and I find this an interesting question because we always talk about leaving the leaves for overwintering insects, but this question says, 
We've been told to start raking up leaves because it provides a place for ticks to overwinter as well as the beneficial overwintering at insects. So mm. she, they're asking to please advise what they should do in that case. Anybody? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tackle this. Um, um, uh, I, I think uh, taking up the leaves uh, on lawns uh, is, is probably, uh, if you have a small lawn, hopefully you have a small lawn. Um, and, uh, and if you have a large lawn, get rid of it. Now let's put a meadow in. But, uh, but if you have a small uh, lawn, I would uh, take up the leaves uh, and put them in the woodland area um, and let them um, have a habitat for, for other species. Uh, um, but the, if, uh, if you can leave them underneath the canopy, that's ideal. Um, and, and then have, incorporate other ground cover, uh, native ground cover uh, species underneath that. Um, and, uh, but uh, as, as, as much as you can, leave as much uh, uh, leaves as possible. You're going to have uh, a, a ticks uh, as, as well, but make sure you get uh, rid of the, uh, the ones that are really problematic are, are where the rodents are, are actually hiding. You know, things like barberry and, and multiflora rose and, and uh, wineberry. Uh, these are invasive species that uh, uh, you should take out of the uh, landscape. They're going to, the rodents are going to hide there. That's where the ticks are going to be. Um, so, and, uh, but ticks are part of the, the landscape uh, as well. And by, by creating diversity that um, uh, Cindy and, and, and Melissa were talking about, is that's where stability in, in the uh, ecosystem is really happening, is by creating uh, diversity. So I, I, I would, uh, um, you know, personally, I, I, I would like to, I keep uh, uh, the area clean next to the house. Um, and, uh, but further, uh, as close as I can, uh, you know, uh, I would leave um, open areas uh, where there's lots of leaves and, and uh, vegetation. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and um, there have been many studies, um, <clears throat> many studies actually coming, um, well, from all over, but in particular, I'm thinking one of ones that are coming out of the Cary Institute um, of Ecosystem Studies in Millbridge, New York, so not so far away, where they've been doing a lot of work on limes and ticks and, and things like that. But anyway, you know, studies have been showing that the, the more biodiversity that your area supports, the more effective um, you are at um, reducing tick populations, but also reducing lime. So even though you still may have ticks, you're going to have fewer ticks that are actually carrying lime. So leaving those leaves, trying to mimic a natural system as much as possible, having that diversity, having those natives, um, those are all the things that encourage all of our pollinators, healthy um, population of insects, a pop, pop, uh, a healthy population of smaller mammals and rodents and, and everything. And as long as you have a really sort of well functioning system, you're not having a system that's heavily disturbed and is um, really supporting and favoring high populations of white footed mouse, mice rather, and more deer and the things that promote more ticks and more likelihood that those ticks are actually going to be carrying Lyme. So, I mean, there's a lot more to sort of what I'm talking about. I could share links if somebody wants um, sort of links to some of these studies to get sort of a better understanding of the complexity of what I'm talking about. But the bottom line is biodiversity um, is sort of one way that we can fight Lyme's disease and ticks and the, these issues and leaving those leaves is like a really important component of that. So, you know, maybe like Del was saying, clean them up close to the house, but as soon as you can transition into a much more natural habitat, the better for all. So this specific questioner um, said that in their instance, they have no lawn, all gardens. So I'm wondering, would it make sense to just leave them in the garden beds in that case? So you certainly can do that. Um, um, I do that. Uh, and it's so it, you know, it makes fall cleanup much easier. <laughs> um, you know, and I rake the areas where I don't want the leaves into all of the garden beds and, 
you know, I have a lot of different kinds of leaves going into those garden beds. You get some really big red oak leaves in particular I'm thinking of that, you know, um, can, in the spring, I end up sort of moving them around a little bit if they're, you know, really covering the crowns of a few of my plants. But, um, you know, leaving the leaves in ornamental garden beds is a very viable option. And a lot of people, I think, are maybe a little bit afraid of doing that, but um, I can testify that it works very well with the one caveat being that there are a few things that you may have to sort of move the leaves a little bit in the spring where you know, you know, you've got the crown of a few perennials that are a little bit more sensitive, need that immediate light. But most of my native plants just come right up through anything. And, uh, and they do really well with a, a pretty substantial layer of leaves over the garden beds. That's great. Um, I know Vivian has a question. Vivian, if you'd like to unmute yeah. and ask your question. Um, hi, it's a follow-up question about leaves. Uh, the first is a comment. I have a small amount of lawn and I used to have somebody blow the leaves off. But now what, I what I'm going to do, I'm already doing it, is I mow the leaves to make them small and chip. And I believe small bits of leaves are fine for leaving on lawns. I, I believe it's a helpful kind of nutrition for the leaves. Um, so I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong about that. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, I'm also planning to leave leaves on my flower beds, but I wondered if there's um, a high, an amount, a depth of leaves, which is too much, too smothering, or whether I can, they, they can survive that. As I gather that um, Melissa was saying, so that's what I'm wondering. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I'll start. And then, um, you know, I, have, I would say the, the, the depth of leaves in the fall ends up being much different than the depth of leaves in the spring. <laughs> um, just as, you know, because of the, they, they sort of pack down and they get wet and they start to, they actually start to do a little bit of their decomposing over that winter time, although, um, you know, only a little and then different leaves decompose at different rates, certainly. Um, I would say, you know, I can put um, six inches in some areas. But again, I did say, you know, in some areas where I know that I have plants that can't take that, I will sort of move things in the spring but I leave all of my plants standing through the winter as well. And that actually does help. So instead of going through, instead of cutting back all of the, the stems of my perennials, um, I leave those standing so that it's very easy for me to find the crowns of those plants. And it actually somewhat protects the crowns of those plants because the leaves don't pack in all around those plants. They sort of go in around the edges. And then they sort of pack down into the, um, over the winter and, and you have a much, um, you know, now it's down to one or two inches really because they've packed down. Um, the leaves, if you're mulching, if you're mowing your lawn and they're, you know, you're mulching the leaves back into and leaving that on your grass, that is actually very good and that's good nutrition for your lawn, that's great. Um, one of the things that people are, are talking about a lot more now in, in like mulching leaves though in general, if you were collecting your leaves specifically to mulch them and put them on your beds, the, the recommendation is to not do that because you are killing so many um, of our pollinators that are overwintering in those leaves. So leaving them whole and not cutting them, um, is a better idea for the pollinators. But, um, you know, so, so I would say that specifically if you were uh, collecting leaves just to shred them, to put them onto the beds um, as a mulch, it's, it's preferred to leave them whole. So I don't know if anybody else has more to add. I, I just wanna uh, uh, just add that the quality of the uh, different kinds of species are, are, are um, uh, uh, different too. You know, maples are very thin. They'll, they'll, they often fall first uh, and they'll pack down uh, flat. 
uh, and can sometimes, uh, if it's too much, it can smother it. Um, uh, oak leaves, because of the tannins in, in the, uh, the oaks, they'll, they're more uh, crispy and they, they're, they have more air uh, flowing through them. So it's a different quality. So you have to really identify what kind of species that you have growing um, around the area that you're, you're, you're talking about. So, um, but uh, I, I agree with uh, Melissa in terms of uh, leaving uh, the plants as, as whole as possible. Breaking it down is gonna uh, basically create a mulch and it's gonna, more bacteria is gonna uh, break it down quicker uh, and so it turned into soil, but you're also uh, um, affecting the species that are already are hiding in there and, and, and sometimes uh, uh, nesting. So um, I, I, I recently just uncovered uh, uh, some uh, leaf uh, areas that I was, um, uh, it was a vegetable garden that I was clean, cleaning out. And I noticed this um, marble um, salamander that was hiding under there. And uh, he wasn't too happy about uh, me moving him, uh, although he's pretty lethargic <laughs> this time of year. <laughs> I ended up moving him into a leaf area underneath the log, and, and uh, I think he'll be happy there. But, um, you know, just be aware of, uh, of that, of the, of the different kinds of species uh, uh, of, of leaves and how they, they affect, you know. Cindy, did you want to add to that? Just one tiny little thing uh, for anybody who's listening who has too many leaves. Um, um, and if you cook food at all, um, if you have a spot in your yard or your garden at all for a pile of leaves, I, I find leaves. I, I go into the city of Kingston and I pick up as many bags of leaves that people have raked up that I can possibly get for my garden. Um, and all winter long, I take the, a big, I put a big pile of leaves in my garden and I throw in all my coffee grounds, all my eggshells, all my peelings of vegetables, um, anything I have in that comes out of my kitchen that's not meat goes into that pile of leaves all winter long. And you don't need a fancy compost machine or a bin or a roller. And if you have just that much a little spot in your yard for a pile of leaves you can throw all of your kitchen waste in there instead of putting it in the trash and you know in the you you know you turn it around from time to time and in the spring you go out you turn it around and in the bottom there will be a, a lot that's compost and then whatever's not composted yet you sort of move over and through the summer it will compost but um i i I, I'm so dismayed by every household in this country that's not putting their green materials from their kitchen into leaves. <laughs> that if you have the chance to do that, please do. <laughs> oh, that's it. I love you encouraging that, Cindy. It's wonderful. Um, now that Can I gonna... say one more thing, Ellie? Sure, Melissa, yeah. go for so, it. So here's another thing that I like to do with, um, this is sort of feeding off of what Cindy was saying you know, cause I end up having too many leaves, um, you know, for my different garden beds. And, and because I have so many oak leaves and like Del was saying, you know, you do have to consider the different, um, the, the qualities of these leaves. And if I put way too many oak leaves, they're just huge and they decompose more slowly. So anyway, what I will do is I will make specific piles just off to one side of my yard. It's just a big leaf pile and that leaf pile we lost her. Oh no, I think we might have lost Melissa. <laughs> She'll be back. She'll be back. Um, going on the, going on, kind of riffing off of the question about the leaves, um, what are some things that folks can do to prepare their landscape to support overwintering insects and birds throughout the winter? I think the main thing to support oh. birds and overwintering oh, insects is to not we're going to get back to you, Melissa, in one second. We're holding that thought about your compost. Um, <laughs> don't cut everything back all the way. In this, in, you know, particularly if you have um, perennials or shrubs that have any sorts of seed heads or berries on them, leave them for the birds, mullions and the berry, whatever you have. Um, the birds will come and be so happy for them. 
And then if you can at least leave some of your stocks standing, and I know there was uh, a little conversation earlier, which I'm not sure if I got the whole gist of about the bees and how you do that, but leave some, some of your stocks of perennials and things like that for um, insects to burrow into. Um, and Dale, I don't know if you want to jump off that or if you want to go back to Alyssa and finish that composting question. No, oh, yeah, I think that uh, Melissa, let's listen to what she had to finish up on. <laughs> oh, I, I saw suddenly my face was just like, ah, and it stopped. <laughs> so sorry about that. Wi-Fi. Um, anyway, just quickly, because I was really almost done. Um, I get excited about all this silly stuff. Huh? Um, but the leaves, you know, so big leaf pile, the leaf pile ends up having two wonderful sort of um, functionalities for me. One is that it helps me keep composting and keep my compost hot longer through the winter because as I'm adding in my greens from the, the, the household, right, I can keep adding my brown component. So I'm getting my nitrogen carbon balance correct and I can keep a hot compost pile going longer into the winter. That's one thing. And then number two is that what remains of that leaf pile that was just sitting there, it's, you know, slowly starting to decompose. It's doing fabulous thing. You get all this fungal growth moving through with the mycorrhizae and everything else, right? And then in the spring, as I'm going around and looking at my garden beds and I see these little patches that need just a little bit more leaf mulch here and there, I end up just grabbing those by the handfuls and I'm spreading them around and it's like black you know, it's gold. It's not black gold yet because it hasn't decomposed, right? But it's just such wonderful stuff. And, um, you know, these are the things that make for a very happy garden. Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah. does, does anyone else have any questions? Because we can enter them into the chat or, oh, here we go. Mary Jo, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? I think so. Thank you. This, this is this is wonderful. This whole discussion. I'm very very happy. I'm on, and I appreciate the the gift that you guys are giving us. I have two questions. They're they're not about current gardens, but they're about uh, dilemmas that I had this summer. And one was I'm wondering what happened with the maple trees this summer. And the other question is, I realized this spring that I had those jumping or dancing or whatever you want to call them earthworms very aggressive little earthworms. And I'm so worried that they're about to, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about what's happened to my, my garden, even though it's biodiverse in so many ways. What is the, what, what can I do to, to, to forestall damage from these, these crazy little earthworms? They really are crazy. <laughs> so those are my questions because I'm worried about the balance being disturbed by them. It already is disturbed by the earthworms. Who'd like to jump in I'll, on that one? I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be the jumping worm on, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the first question about the uh, maples, uh, I, I've noticed that the uh, sugar maples uh, specifically uh, are the, were uh, turning brown uh, in this area. Uh, I, uh, I know. It, and I suspect that it's a, uh, a fungus uh, that's been uh, attacking them uh, because of the wet uh, summer that we had. Um, and I think it really affected them uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I haven't done enough research on that, uh, the specifics uh, on that. And uh, I, my feeling is that they'll recover. Um, you know, native plants uh, often go through, uh, you know, periods of, of stress. Uh, and I, I think they, they're, they're feeling it. Um, um, the red maples are, are doing well. The other maples as well, uh, striped maple, and uh, are doing fine uh, as what I could see. Um, so they weren't as affected. It was very specific to the uh, sugar maple um, yes. that I've noticed. But uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the uh, jumping worm that you mentioned, is, uh, it is a, a real uh, problem. Um, and they, uh, because of the, their, the live on the surface of the, uh, the soil. They don't go underneath. All, all earthworms, by the way, are, are, are non-native uh, to America. So um, we brought them over uh, and they're great for gardening uh, in terms of keeping the uh, aeration of the garden, 
but uh, in the woodland area, they are not, uh, a, a, whether they be a, a European or an Asian, it doesn't matter. They're, they're not uh, really a good thing to add to the uh, woodland area. Um, so, you know, they just turn over the, uh, the, uh, the uh, carbon too fast. And that's, that's the problem. How to deal with them? They, um, you know, uh, Dan Snyder is on our our uh, our team, and uh, they really don't have uh, um, an answer yet uh, how to deal with that. So uh, when you find them, um, uh, you know, try to uh, dispose of them as uh, don't add them to the soil again. Get rid of them. Um, as, as my my suggestion. Some people do solar solarization uh, on the on the surface. Um, uh, I don't know how effective that is, but, um, you know, it, it can uh, dis uh, disturb uh, uh, the bit, uh, uh, ground covers uh, that are growing. Uh, they'll um, uh, eat, uh, eat away, I think, at the, uh, the roots of the plants as well. So I've lost some uh, ground cover as, uh, in the, in, uh, that I've seen in, in, on projects. So it's, it's, it's a, a real problem. And I, I think you just have to keep an eye on it. Uh, CRISP uh, is, uh, is really working hard to uh, do research on that. And I, I think uh, we just need to um, keep a uh, focus on how to not uh, uh, spread it. We're doing that's why one of the reasons why we had a seed exchange rather than a plant exchange. Because we don't want to uh, um, uh, end up uh, spreading um, uh, jumping worms uh, into other gardens. Anybody just, else? Uh, just to give a little bit more information, um, Dell had mentioned Dan Snyder, who works for the Catskill Center on the Catskill Region Regional Invasive Species Partnership, which is our local organization um, that deals with invasive plant and insect species. I'm not sure. I think they might also. Um, deal with aquatic invasive species as well. Um, yeah. You can find them online through either the Catskill Center's website or just by Googling Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership if you have um, an, you know, any other questions about invasive species. And if you have a huge you know, invasion of invasive plant species, you should contact them. Um, they would like to know what is growing where so that they can help you deal with eradicating them. Yeah, I'm a member of the uh, of the group, but I wonderful. I realized that uh, two years ago, I was noticing my vinca was very in bad shape, and I was wondering why these. Ch I mean, they were all the castings underneath, and now I'm realizing my garden, my yard, my my meadowish garden, is is infested with them. Even the pots that I had plants growing in have signs that they're they've been in there. So I'm I'm sort of freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, does anybody else want to speak about the jumping worms? Does anybody else have, help, have any help or suggestions? Let me just tell um, you, one, I've been putting them in a pail of water and then I leave and then I dump it when they're dead and let the birds have it, but that's not enough. No, yeah. I can just, the only thing, cause I've, you know, been concerned about it myself. And the only thing that I, that I, that I know is that you know, the worms themselves um, die each year when, when the ground freezes, but they do leave behind a small egg casing or something so that they will come back next year. So if you are moving plants from one place to another, it's probably really important to really wash the plants that you're moving so you don't take any of those egg casings with you. And then um, it's one of my things to do this winter while I'm sitting in Florida luxuriating is um, uh, to do a little more research because I have read some things about the possibility of that there are like nematodes that you could put into the soil that may become predatory to the worms. So if I find anything more out about that, I'll definitely share it with everyone. But I'm sure research uh, will be ongoing as far as what to deal to do with the deal with them. Thanks, Cindy. Melissa, did you want to <laughs> weigh in? <laughs> Just uh, I I don't know much about this, so I don't have much to say except I want to plug IMAP invasives because um, it is really a critical component for uh, CRISP and 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 all of the other 
um, PRISM, the Invasive Species Management Programs, to try and get a hold on, on the situation and figure out where things are happening. And a couple of months ago, I actually looked um, online at the IMAP Invasives recordings of jumping worms in the greater Woodstock area, and there were only like two sightings recorded, but I'm hearing so many people talk about it. So if more people can actually get that documented in IMAP invasives, it really is helpful. And I think that the, you know, there were just a couple that were documented, none of them had been confirmed yet. Um, and I had talked to Dan Snyder about it too, and he, you know, he was emphasizing the importance of having people um, record their sightings of invasive species, even if it's just a couple, you know, just put that information in there so they can start tracking it. And, and you know, when they can do something about it, they're better able to do it if they know where to start, you know, where to start their work. Thanks, Melissa, for mentioning that. That is a great, great tip. <laughs> um, I believe Roberta had her hand up earlier. Roberta, did you want to unmute and ask a question? Maybe. Oh, sorry, I couldn't unmute. My, I just had the whole jumping worm thing, but that was kind of answered. It's it. They're like all over the place in my yard and in my compost pile. They pretty much destroyed my compost pile. Um, and my poor kids who have been for years collecting worms all around my yard and throwing them into the compost pile are horrified by the fact that I am now, uh, you know killing these worms and they think that I'm like the worst mother in the world <laughs> for doing that but uh you know it's it's super stressful they're driving me bananas that that was it <laughs> okay well thank you so much and thanks for trying to eradicate your jumping worms we appreciate it <laughs> hey, I just want to uh, jump in on this one thing <laughs> no, no pun intended uh but the uh um when you think of a, a, a invasives it's really important to understand that uh uh, that it's, it's, it means that it's out of balance uh, with uh, the ecosystem. So um, uh, it's not that the, uh, the worms are bad, you know, or, or you know, a barberry is bad or, or, or you know, multiflora rose is bad. They're not bad, they're just out of balance with the, uh, the uh, ecosystem. It just takes native species uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes 900 years uh, for relationships uh, uh, between insects and native species or, or to, to uh, coexist. So, you know, uh, you know, we don't have 900 years to, to, to waste like that <laughs> uh, to take, uh, but uh, a lot of these invasive uh, species are here to stay. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and we have to incorporate sometimes uh, uh, through uh, science that uh, we can bring uh, uh, other species that from the native uh, uh, habitat and then bring them over. But it's still that uh, uh, has prob problems in themselves. They have to be really studied thoroughly. We've made mistakes in the past doing that and uh, it's caused other problems that are even worse. So um, uh, the uh, woolly adelgid is, a, is another one invasive species uh, that uh, they think they it might be uh, able to control that. And that's a really important species uh, because it cools the ground uh, water in and also the uh, edges of streams. Um, so um, if we change, it changes the temperatures of the, of the streams, it's gonna uh, change the, the whole ecosystem and other species like trout won't be able to survive in warm water. So, uh, but we're bringing in uh, certain um, uh, bugs and, and other uh, organisms to be able to keep those in control. And, uh, and after much uh, study, they, re they feel confident that uh, it, it's worth doing. So, um, so I just wanna make, uh, it's not, don't get freaked out about these things. It, it just be more curious, you know, that's a superhero uh, kind of, uh, um, um, uh, 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 way of approaching it is to be curious and, and study it and, and find out more about it. What, what was it like in their, in their native habitat? What, what kept them in check there, you know, and keep the conversation going. Thanks, Del. Um, I have another question that came in through the chat. It says, hi, wonderful gardeners. I recently bought a little house in Rhinebeck and there's an abundance of large ewes up against the house. I'm not a fan of gloomy use. What can you suggest as a replacement? Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> well, I, I'll jump in real quickly. Uh, you know, if uh, uh, use are uh, um, mainly because the deer uh, eat those <laughs> those plants, they're actually poisonous uh, to human beings, um, which is pretty extraordinary that they're able to uh, uh, tolerate that. Um, but they're um, uh, they're also using uh, 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 the uh, uh, the use of, uh, for a cancer treatment as well. There's a taxol uh, 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 that comes from the Western U, uh, uh, especially, but the other use are uh, Canadian U that grows here uh, is also um, um, used for that. But anyhow, uh, the um, uh, I, I would recommend uh, using inkberry uh, is a really good uh, choice. There's a lot of uh, uh, compact ones. Uh, that's an evergreen. It's a native uh, holly. Uh, and it uh, is somewhat deer resistant, um, and uh, and I, I think it's a it's a good uh, uh, a good one uh, as a, a as a substitute, and it's not a, a boxwood. A boxwood is not native, uh, so um, and there's a lot of uh, choices now that uh, right, uh, they they have compact ones that uh, almost uh, as a substitute for comp, uh, for boxwood. So they're they're those are really really good. Uh, um, Varieties. I, I think that's a good uh, substitute. Maybe uh, some other people would suggest other things as well. Whether or not whether deer are a, a real issue, you know, the, the rhododendrons or azaleas would also probably work in the same area that a U would work in. But um, those are also, you know, really really uh, favored by deer. So. If the deer is eating the yew, the deer is also going to eat the rhododendrons and the um, azalea. I mean, the inkberry is a really good idea for a native for that habitat. Um, I, I, would, I also jump, uh, another one that I, I would recommend maybe uh, it has kind of an evergreen look to it, but it's not uh, evergreen, it's kind of a semi evergreen as a, as a bayberry. Northern bayberry is a good one if it's a sunny area. Um, if it's a little bit of shade or even even some uh, sun, you can actually grow uh, uh, inkberry uh, uh, pretty successfully. The native one it gets a little bit leggy, so if you if it, if, uh, if you want to go with the uh, the pure species of uh, Ilex glabra, I would uh, plant other uh, plants that are lower that will cover up that uh, that legginess as it gets taller. Uh, cutting it back uh, will keep it cut more compact. There are, but there are, again, there's a lot of compact varieties that are not as leggy, and that would be appropriate uh, next to a house. Great suggestions. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? No, I'm sure that somebody has a question even if you don't want to ask your question live you are more than welcome to put it in the chat and i will ask for you <laughs> um okay another question came in through the chat how early should we start cleaning out the leaves from our garden beds in the spring before mold sets in i don't I leave the leaves in there. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the mold question, you know, the mold that is growing in those leaves that's helping break them down and decompose. Um, that's all, those are good fungi that are actually contributing to the soil health. Um, so unless there's some sort of a, uh, you know, an, an unnatural um, mold situation happening in that person's yard, or you know, specifically in that area. Um, I mean, most of the molds that are growing in leaves as they're decomposing are good molds. Those are good fungi, and those should be encouraged, really. So I don't. I do leave the leaves in my garden beds. Um, I don't remove them. I might move them around a little bit. Um, but I leave them there to just add to that wonderful layer of organic matter at the surface of the soil. It's feeding the plants. Go ahead, Cindy. I could add to that. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I think it depends on your garden situation. You know, um, 
if you have a lot of heavy leaves in your garden and you've got, you know, tender perennials coming up, you, you know, and, and again, this, uh, maybe I'll throw this back to all of you who are more educated in the pollinators than me, but I know that it was suggested that we not cut all our perennials back to the ground in the fall so that the ones that are habitating in the stems would have a chance to live. So I don't know if somebody, I thought that it was somewhere around, you know, early to mid May that we leave things. Maybe somebody else has a better, closer date on that as far as cutting things back. Um, but, I, you know, sometimes if I leave a lot of things in my perennial garden, I'll want to go out in the spring and lift off some of the leaves so that they, um, not, not all of them, but enough just so that they get a little air and light. Um, so I'm gonna throw that to, back to Dell and Melissa to see if they have anything to add to that conversation. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a, a good, uh, uh, early to mid uh, May is a good time. Uh, and I would agree with uh, opening it up uh, for some plants to just to get some warmth uh, in, into the plant and, and light. Uh, but um, again, yeah, it's it's adding a lot of uh, insulation because even in May uh, we can have uh, some fluctuation in temperatures. So this is uh, it's insulating the ground uh, uh, from uh, changing uh, uh, temperatures quickly. So uh, that's uh, another reason to keep uh, the uh, the leaves as much as possible. So um, in terms of mold. Uh, um, uh, there's a couple of, of things about mold. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, are you concerned about the mold uh, for um, people? I, there are some people that are very sensitive to mold uh, and, and that, that could be a, a, an, an issue. Um, um, but uh, it's, it's unfortunate that in our society that we're, we're being affected by this. And it has to do with uh, uh, our own uh, microorganisms that are in our gut and, and things that are, are causing these allergies, these uh, leaky gut uh, allergies that are ca causing a lot of problems for a lot of people. Uh, there's uh, uh, microorganisms that are in our sinus uh, that are protecting us. And we're being, uh, um, we're in this uh, a constantly a sterile uh, kind of environment. Creating a diversity is going to create a more stable uh, ecosystem, and that's uh, what we really want to encourage as much as possible. And that's a that's a tough one for some people because we've been uh, kind of programmed for many many years uh, to, to uh, we have to clean these out. We have to uh, you know eliminate all these uh, uh, species uh, around our, our house, uh, otherwise the ticks uh, will come. And the the sphere uh, is is creating a, a more of a monocrop of 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 a landscape and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's disturbing uh, because you're actually creating more um, disease uh, in, in the process. Diversity is gonna create a, a better balance. And the more you can do that, the, the healthier you are gonna be as well as the, uh, the, your landscape and plants, I think. And um, so, um, so that, that's uh, my, uh, the only thing I have to add to that. Thank you, Dow. Um, we have another question. Oh, Melissa, did you want to say one more thing? Um, I just wanted to say, and and I'm going to say first, um, I, I'm I'm a little um, I don't know exactly the the uh, the details of this um, with great accuracy, but what I believe sort of the the rule of thumb is for cutting things back in the spring is it's like you know, after you've had three consistent days oh, with daytime temperatures over 55 or something like that. So, I mean, Google it and, um, but that information is out there and it sort of gives you guidelines for when you can sort of aim to maybe cut things back, but it's a certain number of days over a certain temperature. And I believe it's either 50 or 55 degrees and it's like three days consistently, um, something like that. But the one thing to keep in mind with that is that, um, you know, that's for a lot of our native bees, but some of our native bees really don't come out um, until even June. So, um, you know, the more you can, you know, you can cut back some, you might leave some, it's really a personal decision at that point, but um, there is value in trying to leave some things even later 
uh, to try and make sure that you really are trying to support pollinators as best as possible. So it's all, you know, do a little research because I'm foggy on the details, but it's something <laughs> along those lines. Thanks, I Melissa. The, I think the uh, reward of, of having the, the leaves uh, uh, left on, on the site is, is, is um, I have a call. Um, so um, um, I, I, having a, a fireflies uh, uh, and uh, lightning bugs uh, um, in the landscape is such a magical uh, thing to see, you know, and it's all because of, you know, of the leaves uh, left in, on the landscape. Uh, I see them on the ground uh, and, uh, and up, in, up in the trees. It just, it's a, a pretty magical thing. And we're very lucky to have a, an environment that uh, supports that in a lot of ways. Uh, when you, you go into suburb, suburban areas where they're, they, they're blowing the leaves uh, off, they don't see that, you know? I grew up in that kind of environment and it was like really strange not to see the uh, fireflies anymore or the lightning bugs. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, and magical uh, thing and, and well worth it. And so one of the gifts, uh, and I encourage you to go out in the, and just, uh, just enjoy that uh, in your landscape. So. Thanks, Dell. I enjoy the fireflies as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have another question that's come in through the chat. Um, they ask, can you recommend a native creeper for growing along a fence? To go up a fence or just to stay on the ground? That's a good question. Jenny, did you want to ask live so you can clarify? Um, something to grow fairly tall. Um, I had a, a silver lace vine in Rhinecliff, but I'm, I can't remember. I'm not sure if that was native. Well, the first, the first and slamming thing that comes to my mind is Virginia creeper. I'm sure others will think of others, but Virginia creeper is native and um, it's a climber. It has a great fall color. And it also has berries that feed uh, all the birds. Do um, you have others, Dell or Melissa? Yeah, I think so, uh, Virginia creeper is a, a really great one. I, I really like that. Um, uh, the um, uh, there's also a native uh, um, clem clem clematis uh, that actually mm -hmm. grows well. Uh, I uh, just to see even after it's flowered uh, the the. Uh, the uh, I don't know what they're called. Maybe you can uh, the, the, the city. Little, what, are they, they, what are they called? They're worlds. The worlds. Yeah, they're just like a. It's a uh, the uh, and it's so beautiful. I just uh, ama it just amazes me uh, when I see those. Uh, be very careful when you go to uh, buying uh, clematis. Uh, there's some that are non-native uh, clematis. It's actually pretty invasive right now and can take over uh, wetland areas. And uh, so be careful with those. But there are some native uh, uh, clematis that are, are really, really nice. Um, there's some other ones uh, as well. Um, uh, so like, uh, I'm, I'm actually looking at a list right now from the Westchester um, Native Plant Center for ones that they recommend um, for birds and pollinators for vines. And one of them is the trumpet creeper, yeah. which is Campsis yeah. radicans. And then also the trumpet honeysuckle, which is Lonicera sempervirens. Um, sempervirens. Uh, so those are two possible options. I would think that both of those like more sun, mm -hmm. but those are, those are natives um, vines. But yeah, one of the things, you know, I often recommend is that Virginia creeper and people um, are sort of mystified, but I think people need to give it a, another chance because it really, I mean, it's, it's beautiful and it really serves so many purposes and benefits so many natives, plants. And, um, you know, if you have a place that can, that can take Virginia creeper, give it a second chance if it's one of those things that you, uh, you, you don't fully appreciate. Well, that's great. Thanks for the suggestions. Thanks for the question, Jenny. It was a good one. <laughs> um, is there anybody else? Oh, and Alex says that the Virginia creeper is beautiful in the fall. 
Um, is there anyone else that has a question? I'm more than happy to, like I said, read it from the chat if you'd rather not go live. We have about 10 or so minutes before we're going to end. So we do have a little bit more time. Georgia, do you have a question or Vivian? Oh, suggest suggestions, someone asking for suggestions for identifying invasive plants. Are there, I am assuming they're asking for resources to help them identify invasive plants, I hope. <laughs> hmm. I have an app that I put on my phone called, uh -oh, what's it called? iNaturalist.com, yeah. which it's, it's so much fun because it, it doesn't only do plants, it does insects and or it does everything. I'm not 100% sure if it would tell you if something was invasive, but, but it does tell you what something is. And, it, and then you could look it up and see like where it's native to. But I, I, I find it, I love it because when I'm in my garden and I find, in, I'm trying to learn the names of all the insects in my garden. So when I'm out there, I'll take pictures of things and then come back and look into them later and it identifies things for me. So iNaturalist, it's free. It's a free um, app. I like uh, using the Google um, search feature. Um, if you have Google on your phone, the, the actual Google app, it has a little lens in the search bar. So when you're looking at a flower anywhere in the world and you press that little lens, it'll show you the flower and then it'll give you a range of choices. Like it could be this or this. And I found it, it's very useful. And uh, it takes you sometimes to places like Mobot and where you can get, you know, all the, the Latin names and everything. Cool. Go ahead, Georgia. Yeah, can I just say something about iNaturalist? Because I use it all the time too, and we used it uh, during the BioBlitz, which we had uh, a, a, what, two or three years ago. Um, and it, it, one, one advantage, it does the same thing as Google Lens, but also it, it, there's a whole database. So it will add your observation to your database. So you have a whole list of, you know, if you want to go back and look at what you've seen before, there it is in your iNaturalist. Uh, you have to sign up, of course. And it, sometimes it's really amazing because I, one day I was out listening to birds and I couldn't see it, this bird, but I listened to it and I recorded it uh, and put it on iNaturalist. Oh. And the next day, somebody from out there from the, from the iNaturalist community came back and said, that's an oven bird, just from hearing it. And it was like, wow, this is fantastic. It's, it's like having a, a naturalist with you telling you uh, you know what this what this bird is or what what this plant is. People come on from the community and confirm your observation or tell you what what it is what what you've observed. So it's wonderful. I think Melissa was going to mention something else because um, I heard her say the word seek. Um, so if you want to expand on that, and if you don't, I'll expand on it because I use exactly what you're going to talk about all the time. So Seek is another app that's connected to iNaturalist and it's just a little bit more user friendly in that, um, I mean, it was, it's really designed for people to use who really don't know anything about plants. So you, you point and it tells you what it thinks that it is. Whereas iNaturalist will give you a number of options that you can choose from. Um, so iNaturalist sort of as, you know, um, assumes that you might know a little bit more um, but you, I mean, you can use either one, but I do think that Seek is um, even more user friendly and that information you can choose to feed directly into the iNaturalist databases or not. Um, so, but they are connected. Seek is run by iNaturalist. 
And SEEK does tell you if something is native or non-native, but I do not believe that it tells you if something is invasive um, because it's not that, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily uh, keep track of, I think, invasive species for each and every region. So it probably doesn't provide that information. So once, if you were looking at um, a plant and and then you went to the details and it told you that it was non-native, then you might um, try and trace that and try and, you know, Google it and see if it's invasive in your area. Um, the PRISM websites, um, any of the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management websites, there's uh, PRISMs all over New York State have, you know, fabulous listings of what is invasive and what the proper management or the, the best recommended management options are for dealing with those species. So if you were trying to, you know, track invasive species that way, you could sort of go that direction with it without too many steps. I don't have any other um, great suggestions for the invasive species though. One of the wonderful things about iNaturalist as well is it's not just for plants. As Georgia said, there's birds. I've identified all sorts of insects for myself because I'm not an expert and I'm always curious what I'm looking at. Um, and it's also quite a bit of fun for kids. And as Melissa said, Seek is definitely more user-friendly. It, it, you can hold your phone in front of you and use the camera and show it whatever you see and you just hold it on for like a little while and it'll tell you what it is and then you can just move your camera over to the next plant and it'll try and guess try and tell you what that is as well so it's not a lot of you know taking a photo uploading waiting for it to tell you what it might be it's really really like an instant gratification kind of thing so i enjoy it <laughs> does anyone have any final questions because we have about five minutes left um, and we would love to be able to offer just a little bit more information if anybody would like any more information. No? Alex. Alex, go right ahead, Alex. All right, um, I'm wondering if in the last couple of minutes you can give us some, like what are your one or two go-to um, resources like books, movies, just like your, your best of that you could send us in search of um, so we can leave and, and kind of start working on our own. Well, I, I'll just jump in real quickly. I, um, I mentioned this in another um, webinar, uh, but uh, in terms of seed catalogs, I, I, I really think that when you, you pick a, a seed catalogs, uh, make sure that they are neonicotinoid free. Um, their seed, uh, uh, um, uh, they treat these uh, with the, an insecticide on the seed, which is not really necessary. So make sure that uh, the uh, nursery is really dedicated to that. Um, I, I often use uh, Prairie Nursery. Um, uh, one that's often used, and we've talked about it uh, with our group, is uh, Prairie Moon Nursery is a good source uh, for seed and, um, and plants as well. So um, uh, you might want to just uh, get their catalogs. Uh, they come in the PDF uh, download and as well as the, um, um, uh, you, you can also order the catalog uh, for, uh, to peruse. Uh, and this is a good time to do that, uh, to get started and start thinking about uh, the spring because um, you want to get those orders in uh, early because once spring hits, uh, uh, everybody is looking for, for this, um, uh, for the, you know, plants and seeds. So, so. I have some. Alex, thanks for asking that question because I would not have thought of this, but I would highly recommend to everyone who's listening tonight um, I have two favorite podcasts. There's probably a lot more, but um, I like to listen to um, Joe the Gardener, whose name is Joe Lample, but his, his podcast is called Joe the Gardener. And also um, Margaret Roach has a podcast called A Way to Garden. And you can go back through the archives and not every topic will be interesting to you, but there are I've listened to quite a lot and, um, and I know a lot about gardening and growing plants and I've learned a ton 
um, just by listening to people. And, and usually they're, inter they're interviewing people who have just written a bit, a book about a new topic. So, um, you know, during these dark winter months when it's cold and we're not gardening, um, I highly recommend to people to peck through their uh, archives and uh, listen to some of the topics that are interesting to you because I really learned a lot um, by listening to them. Thanks, Cindy. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought somebody said Cindy's name. Um, uh, so the Native Plant Podcast is another really good one that I have really enjoyed listening to. Um, but other than other than that, you know, I, I like Del was saying the the catalogs, the Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon, those are two of my favorites. I mean, I keep those catalogs around for a really long time and I just keep flipping through them and reading. You know, they actually have quite a bit of good information in them as well. They've um, I think plant catalogs have come a long way and they try and use it as an educational resource as well. So and they do a good job of it. So um, I really enjoy things like that. Thanks so much, Melissa. Well, we, I really appreciate the experts time and we've come to the end of our question and answer period. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Alex now and she's going to give us a little bit of a farewell. All right, well, I just wanted to say thank you everyone as well. Thank you so much, Melissa, Dell, Cindy, um, all the experts, thank you to everyone who helped organize this. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you to all your questions. Thank you for everyone who's listening. Um, you know, one of the things I spend a lot of time working on um, with the Environmental Commission is like mapping and studying the ecosystem here. And I'm pretty new here and I'm constantly amazed at just the incredibly high quality of this ecosystem that we live amongst here. And it's so special and it's something that is really unique. And so everything that anyone is doing to help um, protect it and to help support it, I think is really invaluable. Um, anyone who hasn't joined the pathway yet, um, please consider it. If you have native plants at your home and you're not using pesticides, you can have your property added to the map. It's really easy to join. Um, just go to woodstocknypollinatorpathway.org. And while you're there, you can also see a lot of the other um, webinars that have been stored. Um, you can see the other presentations and tons of really good information. You can get added to the newsletter. Um, there's just, there's a lot of good stuff, guys. Um, so thank you so much and have a great evening. And I hope I'll see you guys all soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Great. Thanks thank all. You. Good night. Thank you.